All right, Warpugs, here we are. We are at episode 11, Tanks versus Titans. The Chaos Forces have landed on Vrax. The Imperial Navy no longer holds the system. Vrax is having a large traitor force dumped on it. And they are not just bringing infantry. And they are not just bringing space marines. They are bringing Titans. Now... A Titan is going to do several things to a battlefield. Number one, it's going to rearrange it. You're going to get a lot of landscaping done for absolutely free. You don't have to pay a thing for it. Um, two, uh, any problems that exist are soon to not long, no longer be problems. But in this episode of the Siege of Rack series, it looks like he's tackling the tank battles that occurred against the Titan legions that landed. So... We are going to not even hesitate. We are going to come right into this. <sighs> yes. Um, this is a dark time. This is a time... Like, Okay, so... There is a statement that is made about 40k. Titans are absolute nightmares. But there is a singular statement about 40k that holds true. If your choices are... Death or charging a Carnifex with a table leg, you charge the Carnifex with a table leg. Because that's the only option you've got. And this is the only option the 88th Siege Army had. Let's go. In a fierce, void battle, the Chaos Fleet had all but broken the Imperial blockade and routed the remaining Loyalist Navy above Vrax. Yep. During the battle, however, a large Chaos transport called the Aharon's Bane had been fatally struck by one of Admiral Raziak's fire ships and crash-landed onto the planet. Mm -hmm. Aboard, it had carried the titans of the traitorous Legio Volcanum. Unfortunately for the 88th Siege Army, a large number of these god machines had managed to survive the crash, and their remnants had soon disembarked and assembled onto the Chalia Plateau, ready yes. to march onto the Death Core rear lines. After a long march accompanied by a mob of vehicles and infantry, they had finally arrived at the front lines, and their corrupted machine spirits were eager to deliver battle. If nothing was done to halt this enemy advance, the 30th and 1st Line Corps would be outflanked and destroyed. And there is no doubt that that would have happened because the sheer fact of the matter is, I don't care what kind of troops you're talking about, with the exception of probably Space Marines, but if you, start, if you send an entire armored column with Titans and corner just infantry you're looking at total losses, especially in the kind of warfare that 40k has. The task of delaying the traitors and giving the rest of the Imperial Army the time to reposition themselves and prepare defenses had been assigned to the tanks of the 11th Assault Corps. They knew their mission was suicidal. Few, if any, tank crews had faced Titans and lived to tell the tale, but the brave soldiers of the Death Corps prepared themselves to face the onslaught nonetheless. Outnumbered and outgunned, they drove forward, determined to bring righteous fury to the foes of the almighty God Emperor. Yes. The tracks of the many tanks and artillery created large clouds of dust as both the traitors and the loyalists' tank columns drove over the desolate wastelands towards one another. In the distance, the massive lumbering silhouettes of the chaos monstrosities were already visible. Commanders looking through their magnoculars recognized the shapes of Warhound and Reaver-class titans steadily marching their way. Despite the Warhound being considered a Scout-class titan, I love it this. is still an immensely powerful war machine, standing over 17 meters tall, and its formidable weapons are more than capable of destroying heavily armored vehicles with <sighs> right ease. On one arm, the standard armament would either be multiple lasers or a mega bolter, and on the other, usually some type of heavier anti-titan or anti-armor weapon, right. like the plasma blast gun. 
but considering the forces of chaos and their lack of uniformity, nobody could truly predict what armaments it would wield. Its relative high speed makes it a fearsome foe that will move in packs to mercilessly hunt down its prey. The mm -hmm. presence of even this smallest type of titan was more than enough to completely overthrow the balance of power on Vrax into yes. the traitor's favor. But that was not all that had arrived from the crash. The Reaver-class titan is an ancient battle machine. Classified as a medium-sized titan, it wields even more devastating weaponry than the Warhound and is far more difficult to destroy due to it having more void shield generators. It usually carries at least one long-ranged weapon that allows it to fire at an extreme range to destroy enemy armor, but up close, it carries an even more devastating amount of firepower. Although Reavers are not... <sighs> About to sneeze, sorry guys. ...nearly as big as some of the larger titans, these relics from a bygone technical age are able to destroy almost anything yep. standing in their paths. Although their relatively exposed generators on the back make them vulnerable to outflanking, their strong frontal armor plates and mid to long range weapons make them incredibly suited for the large, open battlefields on Vrax. Mm -hmm. By now, the Death Corps troops were fully aware of the near impossible odds they were matched up against. Lehman Russes and Bane Blades wield capable weapons in their own right. These tanks had already brought them many victories on Vrax. But against these massive god machines, they would definitely struggle to hold their own, yes. if not outright lose immediately. But the Death Corps' relentless orchestration of warfare is not known for doing anything with half measures. The 88th Siege Army had brought an overcompensating amount of different weapon types <laughs> to the siege. Despite the initial displeasure of the Manufactorum at what had initially appeared to be such an indifferent misassignment of specialized material, mm -hmm. now they were more than happy to know that amongst the mechanized ranks moving forward to battle the Titans rode several Shadow Swords. The Shadow Sword battle yes. tank, armed with its forward-facing volcano cannon, is a notorious Titan killer. It is nearly identical to the Super Heavy Bane Blade, but its armament is specialized to disable Titans in a single blow. The Volcano Cannon is amongst the Imperium's most powerful laser weapons, able to overpower Void Shields and turn even the thickest armor into oh. molten slag. Granted, the tank is fairly slow, difficult to aim, and has a very low rate of fire. On top of that, not every shot is guaranteed to penetrate a Titan's Void Shield. But when it does manage to penetrate, the damage is devastating. Oh yeah. For as mighty as Titans are, most of their protection comes from their ability to generate Void Shields. Under normal conditions, a Titan will engage in battle for as long as its Void Shields are operational. Mm -hmm. When they start failing under heavy sustained fire, it will then retreat, and if the situation allows it to take on a more supporting role within its battle group, at least until the Void Shields have recovered. But the mere existence of a tank on the battlefield capable of penetrating all of its defenses with a single shot is a severe risk that should not be overlooked. Massive. The thought of losing one of their invaluable god machines to something as low-brow as a tank instills a deep fear within the proud Titan crews, and so merely the threat of a few shadow swords on the battlefield is sometimes enough to dissuade Titans from engaging at all. But the Titans of Legio Volcanum had not traveled all the way from the Eye of Terror to back down now. Mm -hmm. Their unholy corruption fueled their lust for battle, as they marched straight towards their enemy without hesitation. And there was something the Imperial forces did not yet realize. The traitor forces had another trick hidden up their sleeves. Yay! Out of nowhere, the Imperial troops were suddenly attacked from the air as fighter aircraft strafed their formations. Throughout the war, the Vraxian defenders had not had any aircraft, and with everybody focusing their attention on the oncoming Titans, the attack from above had come as a complete surprise. Mm -hmm. Even the usually well-prepared Death Corps did not see this one coming. The 11th Assault Corps had not considered bringing any dedicated anti-air weapons to this battle, Which so there was nice. little they could do to protect themselves from the sudden aerial attack. Tank turret gunners tried their best to fire their heavy weapons at the enemy flyers, but this did little to stop the fast-moving airplanes from dropping their bombs on the advancing vehicles. Having totally free reign in the skies, the mm. enemy pilots could freely choose their targets, and the disrupting effects on the tank formation was formidable. Fortunately for the Imperial troops, after a while the enemy ran out of ammunition, and the enemy fighters vanished from the battlefield. 
but the damage was already done. Before the battle had truly begun, several tanks were already destroyed, and the enemy had not lost a single airplane. In the midst of the disorder, it was difficult to tell if any of their desperately required shadow swords had even survived the surprise attack. Yep. But if they had not, well, it would simply be too late to turn back now. The Reaver Titans were already in firing range, and started raining down their long-ranged armaments upon the 11th Assault Corps. The Chaos tanks hurried forward past the Titans to get into the battle as well. On both sides, the tank gunners tried to score direct hits against their opponents and disable as many enemy vehicles as they could. The neatly organized tank formations quickly fell apart in the maelstrom of battle. The artillery units halted and made ready to provide supporting fire. The Titans had marched into the range of their heavy cannons, and soon an impressive cannonade rained down on their void shields. Uh. The battle-hungry Titans wreaked havoc amongst the tanks, showing little concern for their motorized allies on the ground and causing damage to both friend and foe. As the mechanized clash commenced, the carnage was tremendous. Soon many black columns of smoke rose from the battlefield as destroyed tanks burnt out. The Shadow Swords had moved into position and opened fire on the Titans. They scored several direct hits against their foes, but the Chaos Titans must have either been protected by dark magic, or the shots simply did not manage to disintegrate the Void Shields. Yep. The Titan Killers had failed to do their job. But their defiant firepower had enraged the Titans. With <laughs> Warhorn's blaring and daring provocation, the God Machines increased the intensity of their carnage. Within moments, the Warhounds were already upon the slow-moving Shadow Swords, and they were destroyed before they had been able to take down a single Titan. Uh. Meanwhile, to the left and right flanks, more enemy armored vehicles carrying Chaos Space Marines moved in to encircle the Imperial troops. The battle would be over quickly. Without their shadow swords and attacks from the flanks, it was only a matter of time before the remaining tanks were also destroyed. Mm -hmm. By some miracle, a handful of troops managed to escape the massacre and made it back towards their own lines, ready to fight another day. But a large section of the 11th Assault Corps was completely wiped out. Despite their tragic yep. losses, the heroic counterattack had bought enough time for the entirety of the 30th Line Corps to reposition and start digging in their new front line. In their new makeshift trenches, the Death Corps would be able to move their Shadow Swords and artillery pieces in prepared, concealed positions. This strategic advantage would greatly improve their chances of holding their own against the Titans. The first line core was a different. Now this is a tall order by any metric. Let me just let me just specify that, okay? A war a warhound titan alone is gonna just simply walk over just about any defense you put in place above it. A reaver is gonna do worse. It, it's gonna redesign everything for you. So this this isn't even this isn't even David and Goliath. This is an ant fighting back against a human being story, however. With their backs towards the Demi's trench, there had been nowhere to go for them but north to occupy the previously held position of the 30th Line Corps. But the relatively small gap in the terrain had made it difficult to reposition the entire Line Corps swiftly, mm -hmm. and so progress of moving the army had been slow. To the horror of the Imperial commanders, the Chaos advance had not been delayed long enough for all regiments to get out of the trap in time. There was a serious risk of the retreating 1st Line Corps being outflanked by the enemy's Hans, you gotta run, bro! fast moving mechanized forces. In order to prevent this disaster from happening, some troops would have to stay behind and hold the rear. The 19th Regiment would be the last one out of the pocket, and thus it was decided that they would instead function as the rear guard. Their orders were to dig themselves in the narrow front and prevent the enemy from capitalizing on the 1st Line Corps' difficult retreat. The 19th Regiment would be cut off from the rest of the army and have nowhere to fall back to. This was, however, still preferable to running the risk of having the flank rolled up by enemy tanks and losing the entire war. Yep. With the enemy titans and war bands of Chaos Space Marines freely roaming the plains, this was, of course, a suicidal assignment. But if there's one thing we've learned from the Death Corps, it is that no sacrifice is too great. The officers of the 19th Regiment were ready to follow these orders without a second thought mm -hmm. and ordered their troops to hold the line. But it so one quick thing, it's like I said early on in this series, the Kriegsmen have no problem dying. They don't have a problem dying. They have a problem dying needlessly. But if you can show that this is going to have this is going to have worth, this is going to have a need, they will sacrifice themselves in horrifying numbers. 
It was unlikely that they truly realized what horrors they were about to face. Their singled out regiment was an easy target, and the various chaos warbands of Nurgle who had arrived on Vrax uh. would not let this opportunity go to waste. The Lords of Decay and the Apostles of Contagion had already gotten their hands on the armory stockpiles on Vrax. Amongst these lay vast amounts of the infamous gas weapon Trimethylene Thaloxiac Tertius, known simply as TP3. TP3 is not just any poison gas, Ugh. it is a horrible combination of highly acidic and corrosive molecules that create a lethal green cloud. When breathed in, it is fatal and the horrendous damage to the respiratory system kills its victim within 30 seconds. But wearing a gas mask may not be sufficient because it can melt skin from bone within minutes. Mm -hmm. In strong enough concentrations, it can even corrode through metal and armor. The reason why it's not commonly used in general warfare and only kept as a weapon of last resort is because it's very difficult to control. Right. Mishandling the substance during deployment can easily cause casualties amongst friendly units. The Chaos Marines did not formally request Cardinal Zaphon for access to this deadly weapon. Instead, they simply plundered the stockpiles and took as much TP3 as they could get their hands on. <laughs> the other Chaos Warbands, like the Cornate Berserkers and Alpha Legionnaires, did not interfere as they were busy with their own agendas. Yep. They cared little about the followers of Nurgle were up to. And so they could freely test this deliciously toxic weapon. Although the Nurgle worshippers did not have much experience with this type of gas, they were confident its effects would surely please their unholy master of decay. Uh. As the 19th Regiment waited in their trench for the inevitable attack against their lines, the first green clouds rolled towards them. Uh, All Kree guardsmen were trained and equipped to withstand chemical warfare, but it remained to be seen if their gear and training would hold up against the corrosive TP3. As the clouds reached the front lines, it slowly started burning holes into their impregnated trench coats. As it got through the fabric, it started melting their skin, which bubbled up into huge, painful blisters. Despite their suffering, the stoic Death Corps soldiers would hold the line. But where the poisonous clouds were the densest, the TP3 seeped into their respirator boxes and corroded it from the inside out. The filters keeping the deadly fumes out of the gas masks started failing. In many places along the line, guardsmen started choking as their lungs started foaming up blood. Ugh. The worst afflicted amongst these had their eyes melt right out of their sockets as they turned blind. Soon, their skin began to dissolve and putrid flesh dripped away, exposing the white bones underneath. Those who had not died already cried on their knees in agonizing groans of pain, begging for the Emperor's mercy. Before any shots had been fired, several areas in the line had already been completely wiped out. While in some places the Death Corps soldiers had endured, and Nurgle, not even once, guys. An organized resistance remained, but even from a distance it was easily observed what carnage this weapon had afflicted amongst the defenders. No other Imperial Guard regiment could withstand the onslaught of such an acidic gas attack so well. The Plague Marines were impressed by the Death Corps' resilience. If only these troops would be willing to accept Grandfather Nurgle's blessings, they would surely make worthy minions. No. Nope. They relished their potent new weapon, but were also eager to witness the beautiful decay from up close. And so, they started the engines of their rusting armored vehicles and slowly drove forward into the green clouds while methodically <laughs> firing their heavy bolters at any survivors. Despite the horrid effects the TP3 had inflicted upon their ranks, the remaining resistance put up a valiant fight. Yes, they did. But the putrid monstrosities proved difficult to kill, and facing them in close quarters combat proved too much. Their las guns barely seemed to hurt these moving corpses. Even an expertly performed bayonet thrust into what would otherwise be considered vital organs did nothing to stop them. Only heavy weapons seemed to have any effect, but after the corroding gas attack, they did not have many of these still operational. They would not be able to hold out for long. As the green clouds started evaporating, a second wave of attackers made up of chaos, cultists, and militia joined the battle as well. Ugh. The Death Corps soldiers were now getting absolutely slaughtered to the last man. In defiance, several platoon leaders called artillery fire on their own position to take as many enemies with them to their deaths as possible. Earthshaker shells now plowed the ground, destroying anything and anyone caught out in the open. Mm -hmm. In their final moments, the Death Corps troops knew their incredible suffering and sacrifice had brought them even closer to redemption from the Emperor. Yes. With the 19th Regiment completely destroyed, the encirclement of the Varaxian defensive lines was officially broken open, 
and any final hopes of still finishing the siege within the original time frame was completely smashed. Gone. This bad news had already reached Lord Commander Julka, who had seen the writing on the wall. With two whole regiments wiped off the map and the imminent defeat of the entire army, he would of course no longer be allowed to continue commanding the Vraxian campaign. Finally. And so he had been busy preparing the safe continuation of his military career elsewhere. Using his political connections, he had already arranged himself a comfy new assignment over the 7,003rd Imperial Guard Army. This army was stationed to fight off the continued orc attacks led by the great war boss Gazgrim. The orc leader was known as the great despot of Dregruk and an ally of the infamous Gazgu Mac Urukthraka, who had led wars against Armageddon. Fighting the Greenskins was preferable to being sent off to the eastern fringes to yeah. combat the ever-increasing Tyranid invasions, as not many troops ever returned from such assignments. And given High Command's failures on Vrax, this would be the fate of many officers. Considering the large number of open fronts against the Orcs, and the bureaucratic nature of such a massive campaign, Julka figured this would allow him time to safely lay low for a while. Once the whole ordeal on Vrax had been forgotten, he would have plenty of opportunity to rise through the ranks once again. Yeah, uh -huh. But with the Lord Commander gone, a power vacuum formed that needed to be filled. Even though the 88th Siege Army was on the brink of defeat, the battle wasn't over yet, and nope. the army desperately required a new leader. The Ecclesiarchy lobbied for a commander from amongst their own ranks. Surely the lack of progress on Vrax had been a result of the lack of religious fervor. They could even provide a certain amount of their own forces in the form of the renowned Sisters of Battle. Not to be overlooked was the fact that their claim was also supported by the Order Hereticus. Their failure to assassinate Cardinal Zaphon had not been forgotten, and mm -hmm. so they still had a vested interest in making sure the siege would end with an imperial victory. Right. Their inquisitors would be able to take the role of officers and lead the troops on the ground. But the Departmento Munitorum wasn't all too fond of their meddling. The 88th Siege Army had been their responsibility for the duration of the entire siege thus far. Handing over command of the entire army to these religious zealots would only cause more problems. Despite the strong ecclesiarchal and inquisitorial lobby, the Munitorum still had a lot of influence. After all, it was their supply lines that kept the war on Vrax going, and if any organization thought they could simply usurp the 88th Siege Army, it would remain to be seen if the allocated supplies and weapons would keep flowing as steadily as before. In the end, the Lord Militant Obscurus assigned the command to Marshal Arnim Kagori. There we Kigori go. Kagori was known for his devout faith in the Emperor and his long record of victories. It was believed that with his experience and zealous disposition, he would be able to turn around the war on Vrax. His appointment would not be able to satisfy all factions with the Imperium, no. but then again, when could their conflicting interests ever be pleased? True. But before the hopeless situation on Vrax could be resolved, the newly assigned Marshal would first have to assemble a relief force capable of stopping the chaos onslaught. Mm -hmm. For the first time, the specialized Krieg engineer regiments would be joining the fighting on Vrax. With them, they would bring even more siege equipment like Hades breaching drills and mole launchers, which the engineers could skillfully deploy to great effect when performing underground warfare. But although more troops from Krieg were always a welcome sight on any battlefield, something more drastic would be required to turn the tide. Mm -hmm. After all, what could infantry truly hope to do against the overwhelming power of enemy titans? And so, Kagori would also send a request towards Forgeworld Lucius to ask their titan legion for assistance. The titans wreaking havoc on Vrax had been confirmed to be from the notorious Legio Vulcanum. Mm -hmm. These were the very same traitors who during the Horus Heresy had been the first to side with Chaos. These most corrupted of Dark Mechanicum forces could not be permitted to wander around unopposed. Yep. And so Legio Estorum answered Grigori's call for reinforcements. Soon, loyalist titans would be on their way towards Vrax. The siege had reached a critical point. And despite the large amounts of reinforcements Grigori had received, it would take all his skills in planning and strategic brilliance to turn the war around. With this many ships on their way towards Vrax, the 88th Siege Army would at least have a fighting chance. Yep. But before the relief force could land on the surface to reinforce the Imperial Army on Vrax, another battle would first have to be won. Mm -hmm. The void around Vrax was still in traitorous hands. Battlefleet Scarus had not forgotten their disastrous defeat during the first void battle for Vrax. It was unknown what foul chaos trickery would await the fleet's arrival in the system. Very true. Ah, oh, it's so lovely. 
guys, the Siege of Rax. Decades long. Way over budget in terms of manpower and supplies. One of the best battle stories of 40k. <laughs> One only made better because of his parallels to real life. Guys, he has done... Janovich has done an awesome job representing this. He has done an amazing job representing this. And I highly recommend that you check out his channel for more stuff just like this. Because, frankly... I mean... <laughs> You're, you've seen it. You've watched it. It's incredible. We need more stuff like this, to be honest with you. We need more stuff like this. So all I can do is sit back and applaud it. I know the programs that he uses for this. I wish my system could run stuff like this, because <sighs> this is outright impressive. It's absolutely amazing. Um... I, Julka was not the right pick for the job. He never was. He was, it was, the Siege of Rax was literally supposed to be just a slam dunk operation. It was supposed to be a slam dunk operation where the outcome was decided before the ships were even sent. And so Julka was just there to literally get a win under his belt. But now they called in an actual leader. And, oh boy, does he lead. Guys, we'll be back for the next one, which is the second Void Battle. Until then, I'll catch you guys next time. <sighs> Titans versus Tanks is never a good option. <laughs>